and quite soon they got 30 volunteers, not Quakers of course, but other people recognised that this kind of facility looking after for a period of time, once a week I think they did, uh, people suffering from dementia and particularly their carers, uh, sharing conversation over a cup of tea and, and cake was an example of Quakers doing what they ought to do, looking at what needs to be done and having the initiative to put their ideas into practice. Now the point about talking about Thornbury, of course, is that it hasn't got a meeting house, but it does, I hope I've shown, demonstrate the characteristics of a good Quaker meeting, forming a mutually supportive community of like-minded worshipping people and at the same time engaging with the problems of society and, and doing something about it. Many years ago, before I had any connection with Quakers, I read an article which included the quote, something like this, Quakers have shown that they don't need priests, sacraments, liturgy, religious symbols, etc. Now they should show that they don't need buildings either. And I thought, well, that's an interesting thought. I've always associated the idea of a church with both people and a building. But can you have an effective church without a building? And I think Thornbury demonstrates that you can, which doesn't mean to say necessarily that we should uh, demolish or sell all our existing meeting houses. But you know, they do represent an enormous cost in time and, and money. Um, if you look at the, the minutes of the last area meeting property and um, health and safety committee, in addition to all the work that's going on at Redland in creating a new fire escape, repairs to the roof, 30,000 pounds. Frenchy meeting needs propping up again, £75,000. These are big sums of money. And it's not only the money, it's all the energy which has to be devoted by friends in that local meeting to getting quotes, looking after the contractors and supervising the work while it's done. I think another argument against local meetings having their own meeting houses is that it's a, a higher threshold for the inquirer to cross. The meeting house is seen like other churches as essentially a place of worship for this weird sect called Quakers. Whereas Thornbury meet in what is recognized throughout the town as a community center, the Chantry. It's a public building, not a place of worship. It's a place where people go to engage in interesting things, hobbies and so on. On the other hand, um, what would be the alternative? Uh, if we try to sell meeting houses, they have a pretty low commercial value. I mean, Portis Head is a, um, a gem in the country's stock of meeting houses, but who would want to buy a place where you've got a, probably a 350 year old listed building with a thatched roof, you've got the schoolroom which is falling apart with subsidence and the rest of the land is full of bodies. And there's no access for disabled people, there's no parking. It, it's not exactly a, a prime site for a developer. So for meeting houses, except those on valuable sites in the city centre, selling them is really not a realistic option. And they do provide permanent public witness to the existence of Quakers and to our values. So my conclusion about meeting houses uh, is that in certain circumstances, and I, I gather in the London area, there are places where there is a Quaker meeting house, which is very underused, except when they are surplus to need, then uh, 
Quaker meeting houses should be, should be kept and uh, we should cope with the, as best we can, with the problems of, of upkeep maintenance. Moving on to Swarthmore Hall. I have stayed there on at least two occasions and therefore to some extent share the very strong sentimental attachment which most Quakers have to the place where it all started, the birth of, of Quakerism. Uh, and there has been considerable investment in, in Swarthmore uh, in terms of accommodation, the cafe, the garden, it's a very attractive place. But it is in the wrong place for the majority of the population. It's difficult to and costly to get there by public transport. And the study courses which it offers, the experience of this year is that uh, to a large extent, those residential courses could be given by webinars and, and Zoom meetings. Okay, they're not quite as good as coming together face to face with other people sharing that interest, but um, they have very much better than nothing. So my conclusion about Swarthmore Hall is that it should be sold to the National Trust. Uh, the advantage would be um, that the National Trust would give it far more publicity than we as a yearly meeting can. It would get more visitors and that um, drawn from the National Trust membership of three and a half million people and therefore would be probably more effective as a form of outreach than it is at present. Moving on to Woodbrook. Um, the, uh, what, what I said about study courses, of course, applies to Woodbrook as well, that um, the, there are lots of new opportunities for study since Woodbrook was, was set up, the internet and webinars and Zoom meetings and so on. And these can be countrywide and indeed international in a way which a residential course at Woodbrook cannot be. Um, and it's, I find it expensive. It's, you know, 300 pounds for a weekend at Woodbrook is uh, to me quite a lot of money. Uh, uh, those who support Woodbrook would argue it's, it's, it, it is special, it, it is unique, but it's still a quite an expensive way of spending a weekend. And the problem is of course that Woodbrook has to compete in the hospitality sector it can't pay for itself without making the, all its facilities available to um, the general public or to, or to other organizations and therefore it has to um, have a standard of accommodation and food which is commensurate with with quality hotels now i find that clashes with the quaker testimony to simplicity. Um, I remember on one occasion when I went to Woodbrook, presumably it was a resident friend who showed me my room. And as she opened the door, I was hit by a wave of heat. And she apologized for this and said, I'll open the windows and let all this hot air out. Well, that's nothing to do with Quakerism. That's the Hilton Hotel. Um, and I think Woodbrook has, in a way, it's, it's come to the end of its life. It, it's run its course. It's a very valuable job over the last hundred years, but the time now is to move on and to use the study facilities I've mentioned, but also, of course, Woodbrook on the road. The staff still have a role to play in going to conduct courses where people are and not expecting everybody to travel to Birmingham. Well, the last uh, building to look at is, is Friends House. I went to a QPS conference at Swanwick in the 
early 1980s. I was at that time fairly active in the campaign against the arms trade. I was on the steering committee and had spent time in the office and I knew how those four employees of the of CAT campaign against the arms trade worked and how effective their work was. Their budget at that time was £46,000 a year. Now I cannot remember what the QPS budget was at the, the Swanwick conference I went to, but it was several hundred thousand pounds. And I never found out exactly what benefit came from this expenditure. There was no sort of catalogue of, of achievements. Over the years, both my contacts with what is now Quaker Peace and Social, Social Witness, I've met some fine individuals working hard, but again, finding it difficult to see what effective change their work was making. And I think the problem is that the French House staff collectively show characteristics of all bureaucracies. Firstly, self-importance. We get again and again that all the work being done at Friends House is being done on our behalf, at our request, that it's all valuable. And that if they had more money, even more of this valuable work could be done. This self-importance leads to suspicion of any competition. For example, the Swansea Meetings project to um, support development work in Madagascar was looked at on with, to some extent, a threat. This was Quaker money going in a way over which Friends House staff had no control. And I would say that if, if we want this work done, uh, we should pay for it. Now, in fact, in 2019, the expenditure was over 13 million pounds. The actual contributions from living members of Britain Yearly Meeting was about three and a half million. So in other words, nine and a half million pounds worth of work is being done at Friends House, which we are not paying for. Where does the money come from? Well, it comes from investment, income, and from commercial activities, letting the facilities at Friends House, the bookshop, the restaurant, and so on. There's, there's um, a culture there that work is to be valued for its own sake, not for the results it produces. And there's an example of that in the report in the Friend for the meeting of Meeting for Sufferings in October, where it says there have been some talk of uh, some problems and difficulties. In the first significant agenda item, however, representatives found, quote, much to celebrate in a report from the group responsible for monitoring the yearly meeting's commitment to sustainability. The group's clerks, Peter Avis and Caroline Howden, talked of how, quotes, incredible it felt to see, quotes, huge numbers of things underway. And they were aware that there was perhaps even more work being done that they had not been able to reflect on. An online session with the Quaker Committee for Christian and Interfaith Relations, for example, had revealed activities that hadn't previously been considered. Quotes, we can only monitor what is recorded, said Peter. Responding, representatives asked about whether it was possible to tell how impactful any of this work had been. The group hadn't been formally asked to report on that, said Caroline. Staff at Friends House were looking at it, she said, but perhaps representatives could consult with their area meetings 
to see how they might do that. That's an illustration to me of work being valued for its own sake and not for its effectiveness in actually bringing about change. Um, there have been, of course, changes since the end of 2019. There's the move to greater simplicity in our meetings and in our structures, and there have sadly been redundancies effectively forced on staff by lockdown and, and loss of income. A second characteristic of a bureaucracy is the hierarchical structure. And with 130 staff as it was, um, to some extent that is inevitable, but there are still elements of thinking that Friends House is a sort of power center um, having authority over the rest of the yearly meeting. Perhaps I would hope less strong than it was in the 1920s when those uh, employing the architect for Friends House allowed him to have a carving of the fasces, the bundle of sticks over the front door of Friends House which is the old Roman symbol of authority, that we are in charge, you have to do as, as we say. And that is coupled with, until fairly recently, a disregard for the special interest groups, which I've always regarded as a sort of cutting edge of, of Quakerism, um, groups of Quakers coming together informally to share their interest or their concern. When I was clerk of the trustees of, uh, of Living Witness, Living Witness Project as it was then, um, we had a, a meeting by which it was agreed that I would um, make the point that Britain yearly meeting ought not to be benefiting from the profits to firms involved in fossil fuel exploitation. So I wrote a letter to the clerk of the investment committee and was told in polite terms to mind my own business that Living Witness had no responsibility for uh, advising on uh, investment policy. As it happened, uh, within a year, the decision was made and uh, investment policy was changed to make sure that yearly meeting no longer benefited from those, those profits. Many friends have complained in uh, letters to the friend about the drift in language and practices towards the business community. And I was surprised to see earlier this year, succession of advertisements in the friend for new staff. And they all seem to be financial people, fundraisers, financial managers, and so on, all to my mind, quite well paid. Uh, uh, you, you think, well, what's this got to do with the kingdom of God? Why are we building up our, our financial team so much? The, the work at Friends House that I've been most involved with is Quaker Peace and Social Witness. Um, but it is a single department now catering as best it can for all issues relating to peace, social justice, and the environment, each of which can be subdivided into many, many more concerns, and they can all be considered both countrywide in this country and internationally. And therefore, however many staff you have at Friends House, there is inevitably going to be a lack of expertise um, in relation to any individual problem or, or concern. Compared with the specialist groups, and if, one, the, the most valuable thing about the Houseman's Peace Diary is the directory of groups. You see 
dozens and dozens of groups, um, many of them uh, 30, 40 years old, where enormous expertise has been built up in the issues which KPSW is, is trying to engage with. And therefore, inevitably, it seems to me that um, all one could do with a specific request to QPSW is, is to refer it on to one of these specialist groups. I think, again, as I've indicated the reasons, there is a lack of, of significant results. That raises the question, where does power lie? Um, first of all, perhaps more than we realize, power lies in the private sector. And I've had experience in the past in connection with the campaign against arms trade of engaging or trying to engage with local arms firms in, in Bristol. And it's more or less a dead end. You get the response that the firm's first priority is to its shareholders and its employees and um, if, if a particular action or policy is legal, we are free to do it. So there's no, there's not much hope of changing a firm's policy by uh, pressure from Quakers, either individually or from Friends House. In the public sector, if you look at national government, why should government ministers respond to reports or public statements or press releases which, which come from Friends House? I think they're seen as being made on behalf of, again, a tiny sect with very predictable views. We have got about 20,000 adults, members and attenders in the yearly meeting. Now you compare that with the Board of Deputies of British Jews, who claim to represent 350,000 Jews. And when they speak, they have a very strong influence on the press and on the BBC, and of course on politicians. So I don't think there's any great possibility of Friends House staff through what they say, bringing about uh, significant changes. So my conclusion is that we should sell Friends House and reduce the number of staff to, when I started attending Quakers, I thought six would be an appropriate number for the central administration. And I've seen no reason since 1980 to change my mind. So I'm a heretic. Am I the only one? Uh, not quite. In 2004, Diana Sandy wrote uh, about the uh, Society of Friends of Truth. And she draws a contrast between friends in the 17th century being persecuted, but utterly committed, traveling around the country, uh, getting supporters, preaching their message with no centrally managed work at all. And the present day, when all the emphasis appears to be on the centrally managed uh, work. She writes, the engine that drove the Society of Friends in Britain jumped its rails in the 1960s and is now firmly buried in secular, political and commercial sands. The questions arise, can it be rescued? And if it can, should it be? The structure of any organization should be designed to enable that organization to fulfill its purposes effectively and efficiently. Unfortunately, structures have a way of becoming their own reason for existence. 
they managed to protect themselves from attack and reshaping. This may be done by individuals who accuse the critics of causing hurt or creating uncertainties in the workplace, perhaps leading to unemployment. Attempts may be made to appease by tinkering with small parts of the system and taking so long about it that in the end, nothing changes. Everything kept, is kept in safe hands. No one is allowed to rock the boat. The only way such a bureaucratic system can be altered is by introducing something much more powerful than human hands. And she goes on to say, a society of friends that reacquainted itself with the power of God, however that entity were perceived, could find it easier to redress some of its structural problems more effectively. That was Diana Sandy of Pickering and Hull Monthly Meeting in 2004. More recently, there was an article in The Friend by David Holmes. This is in 2012. And David used to, or spent several years working in the finance department at Friend's House. So presumably knows what he's talking about. And uh, he, he again takes up the, the analogy of um, the Society of Friends being like a train. Um, and writes, some friends suggest that we have reached the end of the line and hit the buffers. It's time to close the whole thing down. I suggest we are stuck at a red light, torn between our bottom up tradition and our journey towards a top-down system. Perhaps even these choices are illusory. Um, and then he goes on to put forward a third way. Perhaps there is a third risky, living, adventurous way, and he calls it coppicing. We could lay down meeting for sufferings along with the entire committee structure we could lay down the centrally managed work. The support and training of members could be transferred to Woodbrook. He doesn't know that I've sold off Woodbrook. Friends House could continue as a hospitality company, generating profits for, for Woodbrook, and the library could continue as a London study outpost of Woodbrook. Organizing the yearly meeting would only need limited resources if freed from the anchor of central work. And then he finishes, there is a time to break down and a time to build up from Ecclesiastes. Is this now the time to break down our struggling structures? Like a coppiced tree, if our roots are strong, then new growth will appear. And if not, then maybe it is time for the Quaker organization to die. So there are people who are sharing these radical thoughts about uh, the future of centrally managed work. Um, what are these six staff going to do? Could they, um, could we insist that they all be active members of the society? Of course, that's not the case at the moment. I don't know how many Quakers are employed at Friends House, but there's no condition that they should be. Could they work as a cooperative, all on equal pay, no hierarchy, hierarchy at all? I don't know. Those are possible ideals. But the first and most important one for me would be the parliamentary liaison officer. If Quakers are to have any influence in changing things for the better in future, it's got to be through the actions of the 20,000 members, not the 100 plus staff at Friends House. And I would want a person who was a constant source of information about what was coming up in Parliament, arguments that friends might use to persuade members of parliament to change their thinking and ultimately to change their vote. That ought to be supplemented by 
trying to influence public opinion by letters to the press, participation in media programs on radio and television and so on. So that's the job I think I would give top priority to. But in addition, I would want someone maintaining and nurturing interfaith and denominational links, uh, linking with Quakers worldwide, someone in charge of publicity, press relations, the website and so on, someone looking after membership. And I suppose there's got to be a financial person as well to look after the money. Um, there were six jobs for six people. Uh, it would be a very different setup. But um, thank you for not shouting me down. And it's over to you now to make your comments. Thank you. Well done. Well, thank you very much, Graham. I was just about to shout you down. We've got um, about a little over a quarter of an hour for discussion. So um, let's try and make it brief. If you wish to speak, can you put your hand up and... Ray. I agree in some circumstances about Friends House because I have been saying for years and years and years that if we are truly a whole England meeting, if we all meet in each other same for England, then some of the groups which are at Friends House and stay at Friends House should go to other meetings such as Manchester and Liverpool and Cardiff and Bristol so that we become a meeting as of England in the name suggests. Okay, thank you. Um, Christopher. Right. Um, first of all, Graham will be very pleased to know that Central Meeting have had their first open air meeting for worship. Um, I wasn't there myself. I believe it was freezing cold and the trains are very noisy, but um, I hope he'll attend the future ones. Um, my experience when I got involved with Friends First was actually being put on committees was a great way of getting to know um, Friends and how things work. Um, the opposite of Thornbury is what happened to Canesham meeting um, when they lost the premises they were um, renting for many years and, you know, never able to find anywhere else they could meet. Um, on the National Trust, I think you'd have to be aware that some of the properties they're um, given, um, they just rent out for... Um, um, to provide an income. So if anything was done along those lines, I think you'd have to tie them down. Um, I don't really want to blow um, centrals. Well, it was Richard Drakeson who wasn't a central friend, but I mean, um, you know, if you've got a meeting house, um, when there's a need for homeless people to sleep on the floors, um, it's relatively straightforward to set it up. Um, if you haven't, um, it's more difficult. Um, and lastly, I must admit, for some years, I felt that um, there's a tension between employment and um, working for a concern. And I must admit, I feel in a lot of areas that perhaps, um, and I'm not, you know, I don't know about employment laws, but it does strike me that there are a lot of things, which, jobs which might be better done on a fixed term contract. Um, I mean, wardenship could well be one of those because um, um, I know it's sometimes felt that wardens have outstayed there. Uh -huh. Welcome. Um, anyway, I'll shut up for a minute. Thank you. <laughs> Heather, don't forget to unmute. Unmute yourself, Heather. I yes. have unmuted myself, Stephen. I'm just finding the button. <laughs> Be patient. 
Um, yeah, I'm not the best person to sort of talk about, about structures and organisations. My mind doesn't kind of work in that way and I haven't got the experience. But the kind of, um, the, the, I mean, I go along with a lot of what uh, Graham says really does appeal to me. It does raise the vision, though, of um, Quakers receding into small sort of scattered groups of people doing good local works. But that's a little bit what it sounds like. And in defense of meeting for sufferings, um, the, the ideal, it, you know, it, it, it may well be seen to have gone astray, but the ideal is that it sort of gathers the energy of the local meetings and the area meetings and, and, and puts it into effect. That's, that's the ideal. And without a strong kind of central force like that. It shouldn't be thought of as them and us. I think it has become a little bit like that, but it should be, you, you know, as a clerk does, gathering up the, the concerns and the, the energies of those area meetings and, and putting it into effect in the world. Um, I, I rather fear this uh, quake is becoming a rather kind of cosy organization of local meetings who look after each other very nicely and, and have nice places to sit and worship, but really don't have that, that kind of wider impact. That, that's my only misgiving, it's, it's, it's a vague one. Thank you. Um, Chrissy. Um. I would really dislike the thought of um, Quakers be it becoming a postcode lottery of what Quakerism was. And I think that the function of having um, a central, <clears throat> some kind of central presence, and I'm sure it has to be more than six people, is that it does give coherence to um, what could become a very fractured and small um, society. Um, my second point that I'd like to take issue with is that early friends did have a very effective um, support, central support from Margaret Fell and her family and her, you know, the, the huge support um, of Swarthmore Hall, where exhausted um, early ministers would return for succour and spiritual um, renewal. And I think that that still resides in um, Swarthmore. And I would be very sad to see it go to the National Trust, personally. Um, who else would you like to say, would like to say something? Oh, well, I'm always very willing to fill a gap. You'll remember that when we had a business meeting last Sunday, and we were talking about supporting the youth worker, I said I had two points to make. And I gave the first point, which I think she's a very excellent young woman and very good at her job. And then I chickened out of saying the second point. The second point is that it was trustees and Woodbrook between them that dreamt up the idea of having these regional youth workers and they didn't consult sufferings or yearly meeting. It was their initiative. This is the, the bureaucracy taking a lead rather than doing what they should do, which is serving yearly meeting and sufferings. And um, I think that's part of this, um, what the NBC call managerialism. The managers are taking over from the, um, the religious um, part of Quakerism. Yeah, well, I won't say more. Who else wants to comment? Jenny, Jenny wants to come Jenny, in. Yes. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Good. Right. And um, speak near the microphone, please, Jenny. Right, I move forward. Can I start by saying the number of times that I've used the meeting house? And I don't think most of you realize that. But at the moment, we are supporting groups like Extinction Rebellion in our meeting houses. And they would find it hard to get anywhere else to go to. We're also um, in Central, we have the uh, drugs advice. Uh, people coming in. I think they would also find it difficult with some of the conservative ideas in other religions to actually use their buildings. But I myself, when I set the English um, as a second language scheme, used our Quaker buildings to do the classes, to get the group together, 
to run committee meetings so that we actually could launch the venture, work out how we were going to lobby and move forward. And that was successful. And that was launched by Albrecht Turk, who was from, Fen uh, from Friends House, a wonderful person, got on to, with him and knew him for many years. Subsequently, when I met, set up a support group for travellers right across the country, all the three, three or four groups that exist were involved with that. Um, although I was um, the chair of that nationally, other people realised that we needed venues all over the country for meetings if we were to travel and find traveller groups that wanted to be listened to. And other friends actually found meeting houses without me even asking. Mm -hmm. Friends were brilliant at supporting things like that. And um, I think that we have a place with our buildings. Sometimes they're not used enough. Sometimes we've got to think outside the box, but they are valuable. And certainly I think Central is valuable and Redland. And I don't know enough about Bedminster at the moment, but they give a voice to groups that may not get help from anywhere else in our society. And I think we remember that. Swarthmore I've been to, but I didn't think much of the building, so I didn't take much notice. But Woodbrook, was central when St Paul's was rioting we had a major meeting for all friends all over the country about the tensions in inner cities and it was valued and it friends within that meeting were able to voice all sorts of different opinions the room was divided let's be quite honest but it was a place and a venue that was needed for that moment in time and people like me were predicted that we were going to have riots and others were saying they'd have a quick word with the chief constables. We need venues like ours, but it's how we manage them and how we ensure that the activities within them are benefit not only us, but the rest of society. Yeah. I could go on forever with what friends have been in my right. life. They've been brilliant. Right. Thank you, Jenny. Um, anybody else? Who, oh, Chris, uh, Richard. Yeah, very briefly, I had my hand up before just to point out that Jenny had a hand up. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, uh, Graham covered a lot of ground. Um, I, I, I don't feel drawn to talk about the issues of Swarthmore and Friends House and Woodbrook because that's too distant from where we are. But, but I do feel drawn to comment on Firstly, this is a good conversation to have. But secondly, um, the meeting houses we have in Bristol, um, some, something that I've been particularly uh, aware of um, in the last couple of years when we've become more interested in um, climate change and so on and so forth is, is the disconnect between where people live and where they go to meeting within our, within our area. Um, for example, we've known for a long time, um, this is not to point things, it's just to say this is something we need to discuss and work out. W what is it that draws people to a meeting across town that they have to drive to rather than the one that's nearer to them? Um, We've, we've for a long time had, had a difficulty with uh, attendance at Portishead and its ability to sustain itself as a meeting. Um, if all the people who, for whom Portishead is their closest meeting went there rather than to the meetings they do go to, it would probably double the attendance. Okay, thank you for that point of view. Does anybody else? Uh, Anne, would you like to say something? Don't forget to un unmute yourself. Um, I agree with what Jen, the points Jenny's made, um, that we have buildings which can be made very good use of. And 
um, do appear to be. Um, my experience of Quakers, I became a Quaker in 2004. Uh, my first meeting was South East Cornwall, which didn't have uh, a dedicated building. We met in the um, town hall. That worked perfectly well. I then moved to Stroud, which also doesn't have its own meeting room. There were issues because at that point people were meeting in people's houses. Um, and there was a view within the meeting that that made it difficult for people to join the meeting. Um, and after I, I moved to um, move down to being more in Bristol, um, they, um, they tried to rent accommodation um, so that the meeting was more open for people to, to attend rather than someone's house. Um, but there have been all sorts of problems with that, with finding the right kind of accommodation. Yeah. So there are disadvantages in not having your own building. Um, but I do very much agree with Jenny that we may need to make good use of buildings where we have them. Yeah, thank you. Right, well, we're getting towards the end of our time now. Um, I'll let Graham have a last word, but before I do, before I forget, um, somebody did ask me to switch on the recording, which I did shortly after Graham started. If anybody has an objection to us having a recording, I think um, David will probably put it on our private YouTube channel, which that means that not the public can see it, but people who get the okay can see it. But, so if you have any doubts about the recording, please contact me after the meeting. So um, Graham, do you, Graham, do you have any last words you wish to, uh, to add? Uh, not really, but I'd like to thank everybody for being so polite and not shouting me down at any, any stage. And um, I hope that this has contributed to a continuing discussion about to the way we organize ourselves. Uh, I do accept that our central staff of six may have to be increased to perhaps seven or even eight, but um, I, I've remained to be convinced that 130 are, are needed in that position. So carry on the discussion and thinking and reading and uh, let's continue to contribute to uh, the, the formation of a yearly meeting that really works, that really is effective in furthering the kingdom of God rather than looking after our, our, our own finances. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, Patsy, would you remind us? Oh, yes, it's, it's next week it's Heather, um, and she asks us all to bring, is it a favourite poem along to the meeting? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, you, you don't have to. If you want to come along, it's just an excuse to read a lot of nice poetry. Uh, but if you like, bring along a, a poem that you like and say, be prepared to say why you like it. OK, thank you. Well, thank everybody for coming. See you next week. Bye. Bye bye.